If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. And we're looking at verses 12 to 20. Paul's love for the Galatians. Galatians 4, 12 to 20. I'm going to begin by reading the passage. I beg of you, brethren, become as I am. For I also have become as you are, you have done me no wrong. But you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. So have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner, and not only when I am present with you, my children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. But I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Amen. Will you pray with me? He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Amen. In his book, Come Back, Barbara, Jack Miller tells the story of his daughter, Barbara, who, although growing up as a PK, a pastor's kid, uh, went through many years of very defiant behavior and uh, really just open rebellion. And the book tells the story of all that Jack and Barbara went through in their relationship during those years. Chapter 11, the book almost won book of the year when it came out. <clears throat> but chapter 11 in the book is entitled The Last Battle. It's a great read if you haven't read it. Uh, and it speaks of Jack's last attempt to reach Barbara with the gospel after many years of mistakes and previous confrontations with her. Now, as the book ends, fortunately, Barbara comes around, and she becomes a Christian, and her and her husband um, are having a very fruitful ministry and have for years uh, in the Philadelphia area. Now, the point I want to make is this. <clears throat> because Jack loved his daughter, he was willing to tell her the truth. Even at the expense of having her blow up in his face, which she did many times. But because he loved her, he was willing to endure whatever ill feelings, misunderstandings, conflict that might come his way. Well, we have a very similar picture of that in our passage this morning. Because Paul loves the Galatians, he's willing to tell them the truth, knowing that it may cost him his friendship with them. And apparently it did, at least for a while. We read in verse 16 where Paul asks the question, have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? Paul was honest with them concerning their souls, the danger they were in by allowing themselves to be pulled into falsehood, uh, falling prey to the false teachers. And as a result, many of the Galatians began to view Paul as their enemy. In this passage, we get a glimpse into the pastoral side of Paul a glimpse into his deep felt love and concern for the Galatians. Up to this point, Paul had been somewhat confrontational. Uh, 
maybe even seemed somewhat impersonal in his approach. He'd been writing more like a scholar or a theologian or a debater. Um, He's repeatedly referred to the Old Testament to say to the Galatians that the gospel he taught them was the gospel of grace, that salvation is by grace alone and not by observing the law as the Judaizers were telling them. And so for the most part, Paul has appeared to be more concerned about right theology or truth or principles rather than people. And it could be easy for us to think of Paul, up to this point anyway, as all head and no heart. But all of that changes this morning. All of that changes as we come to this passage. Paul appeals to the Galatians with deep feeling, with tenderness. He calls them, for example, in verse 12, brethren. At the end of verse 19, he calls them little children. He even likens himself to their mother who is in labor until Christ be formed in them. And so this morning, we're going to hear from Paul the man, Paul the pastor, Paul the passionate lover of souls. In our text, we see, first of all, Paul's appeal to the Galatians in verse 12. Secondly, we see the Galatians' attitude towards Paul in the end of verse 12 through verse 16. And then finally, we're going to see Paul's attitude towards the Galatians in verses 17 to 20. And the interesting thing about this text is that it gives us insight into the kind of attitude and relationship that should exist between a pastor and the congregation. And hopefully we'll glean from some of that and see some of that as we go along. So let's look first of all then at Paul's appeal. Look at verse 12. He says, I beg of you, brethren... Become as I am, for I also have become as you are. Now remember that Paul has been agonizing in the previous verses over the fact that the Judaizers were seeking to put the Galatians back under the yoke of the law. And as a result, they weren't living according to their new status. They weren't living as sons and daughters They were being pulled back into a lifestyle of slavery. And so Paul appeals to them. And he says, I beg of you, brethren, become as I am. Paul wants the Galatians to recognize and live by the spiritual freedom that they have in God's grace. He wanted them to be free from trying to earn their salvation by keeping the law from free from having to live by its outward symbols and ceremonies and rituals and restrictions and so forth. He already told them back in chapter 2 and verse 19 that he had died to the law in order that he might live to God. Paul had died to the law as a way of justification. He had died to all the ceremonial restrictions of the law as a way of growing, of moving ahead in his Christian life or sanctification. He said in Philippians that all those things that he was once committed to were as dung compared to the newfound freedom that he now had in Christ, that he now enjoyed in Christ. And so Paul, with a heart full of joy over this freedom from the law, the liberty he now knows in Christ, he appeals to the Galatians to become like himself in this Christian freedom. And this can be a challenging statement, can it, for us? All of us should be able to say something like what Paul is saying here, especially to people outside of the church. We should be able to say that we're so satisfied with Jesus so satisfied with our walk with Him, the freedom that we have in Him, the joy of our salvation that we want other people to become like us. 
And we can do that if we understand our adoption as sons and daughters. If we're living according to our new status as sons and daughters. On the other hand, if our Christian lives are characterized more by legalism or a lack of joy, it's harder to say that to people, isn't it? Why would anyone want to become like that? We couldn't say become as I am, as Paul is saying here, because nobody would want to become like that. Well, Paul continues in verse 12. He says, Become as I am, for I also have become as you are. And the reference here is probably to his previous visits with the Galatians. When he came to them in Galatia, Paul didn't keep his distance from them. He didn't stand aloof because he was a Jew and they were Gentiles. They were different. No, when he came, he became like them. He put himself in their position. He identified with them. Although he was a Jew, he became like a Gentile, like they were. When he came to them, he was practicing what he preached over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I became all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And now he's putting that into practice. He wanted others to become like him, knowing the Lord, knowing salvation in Christ, experiencing the liberty and freedom that he had in Christ. But Paul knew that if others were to become like him, in his Christian convictions and experience, he first had to become like them. He had to enter into their world if he was going to reach them with the gospel. And so Paul appeals to the Galatians. He says, I introduced you to freedom. Don't turn back to slavery. And his appeal here really introduces us to the rest of, of this passage in which Paul speaks of both the Galatians' attitude towards him and his attitude towards them. And while we get a glimpse here into Paul's heart as a pastor longing to see his people come out of error, we also learn in these verses the proper attitudes that should exist between a pastor and a congregation. What should you look for in a pastor? What should a pastor long for uh, among his congregation? Paul gives us some insight here. After making his appeal, Paul secondly speaks of the Galatians' attitude towards Paul. We see that at the end of verse 12 through verse 16. Paul says, you have done me no wrong. But you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe. But you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy by telling you the truth? Paul begins by saying, you've done me no wrong. When he first came to Galatia, they had openly and very lovingly received him. Even though he was experiencing extremely adverse personal circumstances. Paul reminds them that when he first preached the gospel to them, it was because of a bodily illness, he says. Now, what does that mean? Well, uh, nobody knows for sure. Uh, There's all kinds of different thought on that and uh, commentaries that'll tell you different things. Uh, Some think that he caught an infection on his way to Galatia, which caused him to remain there longer than he had intended. Uh, This disease may have been the thorn in the flesh that he talks about over in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 
Whatever the case, Paul's affliction was such that the normal response to it would have been one of revulsion. And the Galatians had been tempted on Paul's first visit to scorn him or to react in disgust at his physical state. But Paul says they resisted that, that temptation to despise or loathe them. Quite to the contrary, rather than despise or loathe them, he says they received him as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself in verse 14. When Paul first came to them, they had no doubt that he was God's messenger, that he was an apostolic representative of Christ. They were extremely grateful for his ministry among them and the spiritual blessing that they received because of that ministry. But that was some time ago. And the situation's now changed. And he says to them in verse 15, where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Paul asks, where is that sense of blessing you once had? Blessing, makarismos is the word here. It can be translated as happiness or satisfaction. It implies a feeling of joy or fulfillment or contentedness. In other words, Paul says, from the beginning, you were satisfied with me. You were happy with the message I preached of grace. How did you lose that satisfaction? What happened? Why have you turned against me? and the gospel of grace. They who had once received him as an angel from God, as Christ Jesus himself, now regarded him as their enemy, verse 16 tells us. Why? Because Paul had been telling them some very painful truths. He'd been correcting them. He had been exposing error and so forth, correcting them for defecting from the truth. And we see here how fickle we can be, don't we? How fickle people can be. How quickly things can change. Some people appreciate a pastor, a minister, as long as he says what they want to hear. The Galatians had once at one point recognized Paul's apostolic authority and had received him as an angel from, from God. But now, as Paul is confronting them with the truth, with the truth of their spiritual defection, they no longer want him. Rather, he's become their enemy. But you see, Paul's authority as an apostle doesn't cease just because he begins to teach unpopular truths, right? And today, we can't be selective in our reading of the apostolic teaching in the New Testament either, just because our culture is telling us something different, just because our culture is saying be tolerant, our truth is found everywhere, here or there, conflicting truth claims, all paths lead to God, however it comes Couched. And we can't refer to the apostolic writers as angels from God when they say what we want to hear, but then call them enemies when we don't like what they say. And so one thing you should look for in a pastor is that he be someone who's going to teach the whole counsel of God's Word and not someone who's simply going to say what you want to hear. And so we see the Galatians' attitude towards Paul. At first they embraced him as an angel of God, but now he confronts him with the truth and the false teaching of the Judaizers, and they regard him as an enemy. Finally, having seen Paul's appeal to the Galatians, having seen the Galatians' attitude towards Paul, we see Paul's attitude towards the Galatians. 
And we see that in verses 17 to 20. They eagerly seek you, Paul says, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out in order that you may seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner. And not only when I'm present with you, my children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. But I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Now what Paul's doing in these few verses is he's contrasting the Judaizers' attitude towards the Galatians with his own attitude towards them. Take the false teacher's attitude first. In verse 17, Paul says, They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out in order that you may seek them. Paul warns the Galatians that it's the Judaizers, not him, who are their real enemies. They eagerly seek him. The word here, zalo, means to be zealous after. And it carries the idea of taking serious interest in someone. It was often used of a man courting a woman. And Paul is saying to the Galatians, the Judaizers talk like they really care about you, but they're fake. They have no genuine love or interest in your well-being. The Judaizers had no interest in the Galatians beyond entrapping them in legalism. They sought them, but not commendably, Paul says. The Judaizers wanted to shut the Galatians out from the freedom that they have in Christ. They operated much like cults do in our day. They show a keen interest in you, but their real motive is to shut you out from other influences, see, in order that you might seek them, as verse 17 talks about. <clears throat> Think about it. We see that happening in cults. As someone becomes subject to false teaching, to their rules, their regulations, like the Judaizers were saying, like cults do today, those people can become dependent on, right, and then subservient to their leaders. And we see that all over the world. People afraid to break away, overly dependent on leaders, being taught that if they leave, they'll end up condemned forever. The Judaizers wanted the Galatians to become dependent on them and their teaching in a similar fashion. Paul says it's good to be sought when it's done in a commendable way, like the way Paul himself sought after the Galatians when he first came to them, desiring to see them come to Christ, desiring to see them grow in grace, desiring their spiritual welfare, and so forth. And so Paul exposes the real motive of the Judaizers. They wanted to trap the Galatians in legalism. They wanted to shut them out from other healthy influences out there, which again is how cults operate today. Now, compare that with Paul's attitude towards them in verses 19 and 20. My children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you, but I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Paul's attitude towards them is one of tender affection. He calls them my little children. He agonizes over them, even as a woman in labor, until Christ be formed in them. See, Paul wasn't satisfied that Christ dwelt in them only he wanted Christ to be formed in them. He longs to see them transformed into the image of Christ. I like the, the way the New English Bible puts it. Until you take the shape of Christ. Paul agonized over them to this end. Like a mother in the pains of childbirth. He had been in labor over them previously when he first came to them. 
at the time of their conversion, but now they're in the danger of backsliding. And so Paul is again in labor, he says in verse 19, on their behalf. The first time there had been a miscarriage. This time Paul longs to see Christ formed in them. They had already experienced the new birth, but now they were acting as, they, as if they needed to be spiritually born all over again. They made Paul feel like a mother who had to deliver the same baby twice. And so we see the difference between Paul's attitude and the false teacher's attitude towards the Galatians. The Judaizers were seeking to dominate the Galatians. Paul longed that Christ be formed in them. The Judaizers were concerned about their own prestige, their own position. Paul was ready to sacrifice himself on their behalf. So in conclusion, many things we can learn from a passage like this, but let me focus on just at least one area, and that is the reciprocal relationship that should exist between the congregation and a pastor. What are some things we can draw from a passage like this? Well, first of all, as far as the people's attitude is concerned, you shouldn't look primarily to things like personal appearances. That gives me a fighting chance, doesn't it? (laughs) Paul's appearance wasn't that great, right? When he first came to Galatia. But they embraced him. They loved him. They treated him as an angel of God himself. Secondly, a congregation's attitude toward the pastor shouldn't be determined by private theological whims either. Paul became an enemy to the Galatians because they didn't like the truths he was teaching. A congregation should be aware of or should beware of assessing their minister according to their own subjective doctrinal ideas. Rather, he should be assessed on the basis of how faithful he's preaching God's word and the apostolic message found in the scriptures. Their primary concern should be, is he teaching the text of scripture? Is Christ speaking to us through his messages? Well, what about the pastor's attitude towards the people? John Calvin wrote, If ministers wish to do any good, let them labor to form Christ, not to form themselves in their hearers. Isn't that a great quote? What great advice for parenting as well. Parents should seek to form Christ, not themselves, in the lives of their children. A pastor should resemble Paul, not the Judaizers. He should be concerned with the people's spiritual progress. He should long to see Christ formed in them and labor and pray and agonize to that end. When such pastors abound, John Brown says, the church must flourish. We can sum up our thoughts in the words of John Stott, who said this, The church needs people who, in listening to their pastor, listen for the message of Christ. And pastors who, in laboring among the people, look for the image of Christ. Amen. May that be true of us here at Salem Presbyterian. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this passage. We thank you for Paul, what we learn from him, Lord. Um, Would you teach us from a text like this, Father, each of us, you and your wisdom know what we need to hear, where our hearts need to be encouraged and strengthened, where we need to be equipped, possibly where we need to be uh, pricked in our hearts. Father, would you take this passage and Apply it to our hearts. Help us to um, look for Christ 
and hear from him each Lord's Day when we come together. Help us to be the kind of congregation, as we are, that encourages one another and points one another towards Christ. Father, would you grow us? Would you bless us? Would you give us a heart, Father, for the people in this community outside these doors? Would we be so satisfied in our walk with you that we could and would go out to others and say, become as I am, because we find our joy in you, Father. We pray it in Jesus' name, and we pray it for his glory. Amen.